The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, so hi everyone. Welcome to this session. I will just wait a few more seconds, um, maybe one minute tops, to give everyone a chance to join. Uh, in the meantime, I will uh, run a few checks to make sure everything is okay, so you should be able to hear me. Uh, you should be able to see my screen as well. Um, if we need to interact, you know, we have a, there is a, like a chat section, uh, in the, in the panel. So you can place any question there. So, and I will try to answer them either during the presentation. Oh, thanks. One of you confirmed that they can uh, hear me well and everything is fine. So we will start in a few seconds from now. Yeah, thanks a lot. So yeah, if you have any question, you place them uh, in the chat and I, if I remember to look at them, I will answer them on the fly or else I will uh, contact you later with a, a proper answer. So yeah, be aware that, well, know that this session is recorded in case you need to refer to it in the in the future or if you ever want to to share it and uh, yeah i believe we we will start all right so okay so hi everyone and uh, welcome to this session uh, which will be about two major new features of Advanced Design 2022. So maybe I should... Uh... Yeah. Okay, so two major new features of Advanced Design 2022. Uh, but before we start, um, a few words about myself. So my name is Thibaut Frete, speaking from France. And I'm a senior product specialist, which means I'm uh, working on product specification and uh, product validation with a strong focus on steel design and climatic loads this past couple of years. So uh, today's session will be about uh, crane actions and design for call for members in advanced design. Uh, should take us a good 90 minutes, uh, like 45 for uh, for each part to get a good balance. And we will begin with uh, crane actions. So crane actions are covered by uh, Eurocode 1 part 3. And this document is either from 2006 or 2007, depending on the translation you are using. And as usual, uh, it comes with a set of national appendices, depending on the country you're working in. So in advanced design, we implemented various input methods, depending on the information you are provided, either from the manufacturer or from uh, project settings. You see, sometimes you will be granted with um, the crane characteristics, like the self-weight of the crane, the self-weight of the trolley, and the crane capacity, which is the maximum load that the crane can lift and move around. So in this case, you will go with the crane parameter definition that we have in advanced design. And in this case, uh, it will just fill in the crane self-weight, the trolley self-weight, and the crane capacity. And from that, Advanced Design will be able to find out all the relevant forces, uh, not only the vertical ones, but also the longitudinal ones for uh, uh, the acceleration and uh, braking of the crane, as well as the transverse one for, uh, to account for the skewing of the crane and uh, all these uh, actions. In this other example that, I, that I'm showing here, uh, in the description, in project description, we are given actually these crane parameters. You see here, 
uh, I'm pointing out, I, I don't know if you can see my uh, mouse pointer, but I'm showing the 10 tons uh, from the bridge. So this would be the crane capacity. And then uh, uh, a bit uh, later, we are told about uh, the self-weight of the system, total self-weight, uh, including the self-weight of the trolley. So you can fill that in right there, still using the crane parameters definition method that we have. But some other times you will be given the forces already distributed between the rails and between the wheels. See there in the uh, this information, uh, the columns refer to uh, a rail and uh, the lines refer to uh, various wheels. So you can uh, also get that information, feed it in advanced design, uh, this time using the crane loads definition, just feed in for each rail and each wheel. And from there, advanced design will uh, build the relevant load groups. Uh, but this definition mode assumes you already know like um, some advanced information about the crane, like you already know how the forces will be distributed between the rails and between the wheels, uh, that you already know like the um, longitudinal force, HL, or even the skewing force. So if you're given that, you will just switch to the crane load definition. Then there is a third uh, input method uh, that I'm not showing there, which is called uh, direct input and it's, a bit basic because you define the intensity of the load that you want to see traveling. So you might also have a use for uh, this definition mode. And then you will also define the other um, basic data that advanced design will need to properly generate the, the crane actions. Uh, for example, the number of wheel axes. See, in this picture, obviously, we have two wheel axes. And then the spacing between wheels. So, I mean, this parameter speaks for itself. It will be the distance between uh, the wheels uh, on a given rail. Uh, you can also define front and end buffers, which would be the distance between the, the first wheel and the front of the truck, or the back wheel and the end of the truck. Um, when it comes to runway system definition, uh, we've got uh, crane span lengths. We'll, that will be the distance between the runway beams and advanced design can figure out that on itself. Uh, the driving wheels uh, will define where the longitudinal forces will apply. See, it can be either the front wheels or the back wheels or uh, any other uh, wheel axis, they are referred to uh, by a number, uh, one being uh, on the front and uh, the, bigger, uh, the bigger the number, the, the closer they are to the end of the truck. Yeah, one note about the, the runway system uh, uh, definition. In advanced design, we are covering the single wheel drive system uh, not the central wheel drive. We didn't see any use for that because even in the Euro code, we are told that this uh, system is actually quite uh, outdated. Then the other parameters you might need to fill in, uh, like crane system. So uh, it's a drop down, drop down list and it refers to this table from uh, the Euro code one, where you can either choose between a uh, an IFF system or an IFM system for a fixed fixed or fixed movable and that will impact the, the calculation of the H parameter which is used for uh, uh, the skewing of the crane and then the guidance type parameter will uh, refer to this picture from zero code where you can either choose from uh, you can choose between uh, um, a flange wheel system or a separate guidance means uh, system, then the, the skew angle will be set to the recommended value from uh, zero code one in radians. And finally, the friction factor will be set to 
0.2 and usually the value will be either 0.2 for uh, steel on steel or 0.5 for steel on uh, rubber. And uh, last, you will also need to define the dynamic factors. And these dynamic factors, they are used because, um, you know, crane actions are in fact dynamic actions because uh, they are moving loads, but in the calculation, they will, uh, we will use a set of static forces. Uh, so in order for these static forces to properly account for the dynamic effects, they will need to be amplified. And this is where the dynamic factors will come in. And uh, the, com the various components won't be amplified in the same way. You see, uh, everything related to self-weight will get a V1 magnification, uh, could be like plus 10%. Uh, the hoist load, which is a load that is lifted by the crane and moved around, uh, will get a, a bigger magnification. Uh, like it will be governed by V2, and for example, here it, it's plus 20%. And everything related to the drive force will be magnified by phi 5, uh, which is uh, plus 50% in this case. Uh, so let me have a look at the chat. So yes, yeah, so far there's no question. So I guess it's all, uh, it's all clear. Uh, let me check something else in the panel. Yep, all right. Um, so dynamic factor, yeah, you need to 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 define that, and um, yeah, one thing to be aware of when you're introducing, uh, when you're designing a model with uh, crane action, is that uh, advanced design uh, needs to will. I mean, it will consider various load arrangements, um, because when you're looking for the maximum load on a given rail you have to, well, the crane uh, will be equally distributed, but the trolley will be considered shifted all the way on to one rail uh, and with uh, the hoist load attached to it. But when you're looking for the minimum load uh, on a given rail, uh, this time the trolley will be uh, shifted all the way on the other side and there will be no load attached to it. Uh, but don't worry because Advanced Design can, uh, will figure that out. It will consider the various load arrangements. And actually we will uh, see that, see how it transfers into Advanced Design, how we define that by introducing uh, a crane on a 3D model. So let me pick uh, this Advanced Design model and uh, well, it's just a regular uh, industrial uh, steel building. Uh, we've got uh, climatic loads. This load area here means uh, it's got a different color because it's um, it's an open face. Uh, but yeah, this building has been designed and already optimized. You see, if I um, check the work ratio on uh, on a few elements there. See, for columns, I'm uh, getting a 80% work ratio for uh, by the, from the Yoko 3 design, and the rafters are uh, getting a 92%. So the building is optimized, but this is before I even introduced uh, the crane actions, because we will do that now. And the way it works in advanced design is, uh, so first let me work on, yeah, we just need to show the columns and maybe the crane system. So you see in advanced design, you can uh, put the elements in various uh, systems to uh, easily isolate them. And to introduce a crane on a 3D model, first you need to go in the object section of the ribbon. From there, you can either introduce a single rail crane or a, a bridge crane. So we, we'll go with the bridge crane and this will, um, introduce yeah no sorry uh, you click on the bridge crane and then you will define uh, you will define the crane by clicking the run first runway beam 
there and the second beam will be like same length and parallel so you will place it there and this will add a runway entry in the pilot so let me You've got your crane, crane runway and tree. There's nothing much to define there because it will uh, only let you actually introduce a crane here. Uh, so this will add a, a crane entry in the pilot, and this is where you will fill in all the parameters that we've uh, we've that we've just uh, discussed, like uh, the number of wheel axes. So in our example, we had uh, see we had two wheel axes, um, we've got a crane, uh, a 60 kilonewton crane, uh, a 10 kilonewton trolley and a crane capacity of 100 kilonewtons. Uh, we've also given uh, the spacing between the wheels and the dynamic factors, so plus 10%, 20% for the hoist load and 50% for the driving force. So I will define like two wheel axes, spacing between wheels will be 250. Uh, so this is uh, the input method that I uh, told you about. So we got dire direct input, where you just define the intensity of the load and they will be duplicated. There's no concept of uh, load groups or uh, uh, skewing forces and, and so on. It's just a static load that is uh, uh, moved around. And then you've got the crane load definition, where you will define here uh, the forces already distributed between the rails and the wheels. So this is assuming you already know like uh, the intensity of the skewing forces, uh, the intensity of the uh, HL force, which is the longitudinal force. So this is not the method we'll go with uh, on this example. We will go with uh, the crane parameter definition. So we've got two entries. We've got one for America and Canada, and we've got one for uh, uh, the Euro code. So I will go with obviously this one. And you see there, I can uh, feed in the crane self-weight, so it will be 60 kilonewtons, then 10 kilonewtons for the trolley and crane capacity of 100 kilonewtons. Then I will have the basic data, like the crane span length. So this one, I don't need to worry about it because Advanced Design can, uh, can get this information. It's just the distance between the two rails. In 19 meters. Uh, so driving wheels, so it's up to the user to define whether uh, both axes are driving or if the longitudinal forces should only apply to, in this case I will go with the back wheels and uh, I will use the default settings for the skew angle or uh, the friction factor and I will properly define the dynamic factor. So Self-weight of the cranes plus 10%, hoist load will be plus 20, and the driving force will be plus 50%. Then, given the, the shape of my building, I will, uh, no, I will uh, simplify the data by. Uh, I'm expecting the maximum. I'm looking for the maximum compression on the middle uh, on the middle line of the column, so I can already define where I may, where I'm expecting the maximum loads and from there I can actually check the forces that were uh, computed by advanced design you see just by filling in like the uh, self weight of the crane and uh, various data like friction uh, friction factor and uh, skew angle and so on advanced design um, has been able to find out the vertical actions, the longitudinal action and the transverse ones. Like uh, on the critical rail, I'm getting an up to an 82 kilonewton uh, vertical force, vertical component. So if we were to check that, well, it's not difficult because 
You see, we've got a 60, kil 60 kilonewton crane, and the crane will be equally distributed between the two rails and the two wheels. So we've got 60 kilonewtons divided by 4, multiply by, because remember it's getting a 10% magnification, so multiply by 1.1. .1. And then, you see on the critical rail, the trolley will be shifted on to this side, so it will be distributed between two wheels only, not four. So we add up 10 kilonewtons from the trolley divided by two, multiply by 10% uh, magnification, and then you add the crane capacity, which is uh, 100 kilonewtons, and again, it's uh, distributed between two wheels, but it's getting a plus 20% magnification. So that's how you end up with a 82 kilonewton uh, vertical action there. So on the other side, you've only got the crane, like the 60 kilonewtons uh, with a 10% magnification. That's why you've got uh, 16 and a half. And if we were to check the other components, like the longitudinal ones, like the 450 we are getting there. Uh, well, this time the formulas are a bit more complex, but it's still uh, quite easy to check, you see, because the, the longitudinal force is defined by uh, this formula from the error code, and uh, obviously you need to compute, uh, first of all, the drive force, drive force, which is defined by this other formula, uh, which is governed by uh, the, the friction factor. So in our case, it was uh, 0 0.2, multiply MW, which is a number of single wheel drives. So here we've got two, and multiply the minimum load per wheel of the unloaded crane. So that means we're in a situation where we've got the 60 kilonewtons divided by four, and that's it, nothing else. You see, so we've got a six, six kilonewton drive force. And from there, we can uh, introduce the phi five factor, which is the magnification uh, of the drive force, which is a uh, plus 50%. So we multiply one five and uh, divide it by the number of uh, runway beams. So here we've got two, and that's how advanced design uh, find out the 450 kilonewtons. And of course, as soon as you modify a parameter, these uh, values are updated. Um, so we could check the transverse force as well, but uh, I get you, you, you get the ID. And what you can see from this dialogue also is that um, advanced design is already building the required um, load groups because uh, according to the error codes, uh, you're supposed to consider uh, to mix, you're supposed to mix these components in various load groups to cover uh, all possible situations where, uh, you know, in group one, uh, each action will be amplified by the dynamic factor. But if you check another group, like group three, like only the longitudinal force will be, only the drive force will be amplified, uh, but there will be no magnification of the self-weight and then there are other load groups like uh, group number five where you are uh, like discarding the acceleration force but you're uh, introducing another transverse force which is called a skewing skewing force so advanced design is considering all groups and you're getting actually one tab per group group one two uh, three and so on so I yeah, don't mind this message because uh, I'm working with uh, this model is from a, a beta version so I'm carrying uh, some warning message sometimes all right so let me save the model uh, but at this point we don't actually see the crane actions uh, on the model and that is because we have not generated them yet so we will do that right now by going in the loading section introducing a crane family there we will define 
the runway. So one important parameter there is the length of steps. So that will be the distance between each crane position. See, by default, it's one meter, but you can make it. Uh, you can make each position closer, or uh, you can spread them out. Uh, so I will use a one meter definition, uh, default definition. And there, well, let me check if everything is fine. Yep. You just click the automatic generation, and there we will actually see uh, the corresponding forces. See on the model, we're getting uh, multiple uh, multiple forces. We can actually check uh, an individual position of the crane. So here we are, I'm checking uh, the first position of the crane for uh, the for group number one. And indeed, if I check uh, a, point, a point force on the critical rail, I'm getting the 82 kilonewtons as a vertical action that we've just checked. Same thing on the other wheel, and on the other side, I'm expecting a 16 and a half for each wheel. Uh, let me switch to an axis rendering to see better. So we, we have a small uh, longitudinal force here. So this is the acceleration of the crane. It's equally distributed between each rail, and it's applied to the back wheels because uh, I define them as uh, driving wheels. Uh, and then we can check uh, another position, like uh, this one, which is uh, step 15. So it's uh, yeah, basically it's in the middle of the, of the building at the same intensity. Then we can move on to maybe the very last position, which will be the end of the road for uh, for the crane. So this is uh, <coughs> group number one. You see, you can also check uh, any other load group like uh, group number five. So group number five is uh, accounts for the skewing of the crane. So what this situation does is uh, it's introducing uh, uh, an additional transverse force, which is called uh, the skewing force right there. And on a given rate, you see it's, it's referred to in the pilot as a, the S force. For, for skewing. Um, so it's a transverse force, but it's kind of balanced by another transverse force, uh, an opposite transverse force. So the resulting is a 440 something. And on the other rail, we are getting also a 440 uh, transverse force. And what the skewing uh, what the skewing of the crane does, it's actually pulling the rails apart. So we are getting just that. And again, for uh, various position, like you got the very first position of group five, uh, and you can see the crane moving along the building. But you see, we are getting uh, quite a lot of uh, separate load cases from uh, load case number three down to uh, load case number 200. So we've got 200 static load cases so far. So you might fear that with that many load cases, uh, when we start combining that with uh, dead load and snow, we might end up with maybe thousands of combinations. But we are not. Uh, getting that many combinations because what advanced design is also doing in the process is it's creating some envelope cases to cover uh, all the positions of the crane. See, it will uh, make an envelope for uh, the bending moments, uh, for uh, the actions of support on support and so on. So these envelope load cases will cover uh, all the position of the crane. So we will not combine an individual, each individual position uh, with the other static load cases. We will combine the envelopes. So, and the number of envelopes is quite, uh, it's fixed. It's, uh, we only need like uh, 
maybe 15 or 20 of them and we will combine these envelopes with the other static load cases that way we will uh, keep the number of combinations to uh, to a minimum so I believe at this point we can uh, actually discuss the combinations. So in advanced design you will uh, use the detailed combination system. You need to the simplified won't work because it doesn't cover uh, the crane actions. But actually for this presentation, I'm afraid, even if we limit the number of combinations, we still need to compute like 200 static load cases. And that can take maybe a few minutes, but I don't want uh, to keep you hanging for uh, several minutes. So what you can do, especially if you are only interested in uh, some load groups, is you can decide which load groups you want to uh, introduce or not. See. If I remove some uh, existing uh, envelopes and I, let's say you want to, for sure you want to introduce the load group number one, but maybe load group number two, you don't have the use for it yet. And you want to keep maybe the skewing of the, of the crane and keep only these two groups. So when you update, the crane loads. You see, you will get a few less. So seventy separate load cases. Uh, we can have that for uh, for a presentation. It won't take too long. But you see, the number of envelopes is fixed, and so it doesn't matter how many individual positions you have, as long as you have the same number of envelopes. So I believe there was a. Somebody raise their hand. Let me check something in the panel. Uh, no, I believe it's so good. So yeah, if there's uh, any question, feel free to play them on the chat. So far, we've got... Uh, Yep, no. so far so good. So, see we've got uh, less individual position, but uh, still enough to uh, get proper design of, uh, of the model. Um, and from there, yeah, we can uh, generate the combinations. So I will use the detailed combination system. There. I will uh, even focus on the ULS combinations and generate them. Yeah, so yeah, somebody right, uh, pointed out that uh, another way to reduce the number of combinations or the number of positions would be to use, um, to increase the um, the length of steps to, to increase the distance between each individual positions. We could do that, but we risk missing out the critical bending moments if we don't place the crane like in the middle of a uh, of span. So uh, don't use uh, too big a parameter for, uh, for, for the spacing. Uh, so let me show you the combinations we are getting. So yeah, here the ULS combination is starting. So I'm getting the dead loads. And uh, at some point I will get like, yeah, this is a typical combination for uh, when you've got crane because you've got the dead loads with the 135 magnification. Uh, you've got the snow with a 150 uh, combination factor. And then you've got the crane actions. But as you can see, the crane action is not 
it does not refer to an individual position of the crane. It refers to uh, one of the envelopes. And then we've got another envelope. So we are combining the envelope and not the individual position. And that's why in this case, I'm only getting like a, not even 200 combinations. So uh, calculation uh, shouldn't take too long. I will, uh, yep, I will run the calculation on this model. Let me save it. Yes, okay, maybe a better rendering. So we can hide or show the individual position. At this point, the individual position, they don't really matter. What matters are uh, actually the envelopes. So we run the calculation. Well, just finite element calculation uh, for the moment. Uh, in the command line, we will see the progress. I'm just checking if uh, maybe I made an obvious mistake. And we will see advanced design like process uh, well the various load cases. So it still need to compute uh, each individual position. We cannot help that. We uh, it's required because we need internal forces for each position. But then it will build the envelopes, and it will combine the envelopes. So while it's computing. Uh, I can uh, tell you a bit more about the combination. So uh, I told you we are combining uh, the envelopes and not the individual positions. And the typical combinations you will get uh, for crane actions, um, well, they will depend on the crane coefficients. And actually, so they are defined in the Eurocode 1 part 3 and uh, maybe even the national appendix. and. What was surprising is that most countries will use a 135 uh, gamma coefficient for the crane actions. And it seems only France will consider 150 combination uh, for the crane action. And the crane action is also getting, when it's uh, not the leading action, but an accompanying action, uh, it's getting a zero coefficient of one. It's a bit different from uh, the other variable actions like snow or wind, which are getting a 0 0.5 and 0 0.6 when, they're, when they are accompanying. See, when the crane is accompanying, it's actually uh, acting at full effect. So the critical combination uh, you might expect, uh, I mean the combination that will bring the most compression uh, in the columns or on the supports, will be the, the following one, where you've got, uh, let me check the combination. Oh, okay, the combination is uh, already finished. So, um, yeah, the typical combination uh, bringing the most compression in the column will be uh, 135 for dead loads, uh, 150 for snow, uh, which would be the leading variable action. And then you've got the crane as accompanying with either 135 if you are in most countries or 150 if you are in France. Uh, here I'm using the French setting, so we can expect this combination to show up. 135 uh, dead loads plus 150 snow and 150 crane. Uh, you see in this combination I'm only uh, I'm limiting to two viable actions. Uh, I didn't introduce uh, the wind action uh, because I'm used to, um, well, because I'm also using uh, this condition from uh, the national, the French national appendix, where unless specified, the combination will be limited to two viable action. So that's why I'm only. Uh, uh, I only put snow and, and, and crane there. Uh, but anyway, even wind, it wouldn't bring that much, especially if wind is a, when it's an uplifting force, uh, it wouldn't change much the compression we're getting uh, in the columns. But uh, 
Um, yeah, that's for combination. That's uh, what I wanted to to show to point out. So the combination is is done now. Yeah, and see. So I've just run the finite element calculation because then we can check the internal forces we're getting for uh, uh, with the current actions. So sure you can like check an individual position see again if i just focus on the, yeah, the vertical members you can pick a given position you can even display the corresponding forces you can isolate this position um, position number one and you can check the bending moment here on the beam and uh, and the supporting uh, columns you can do that for the very first position you get the maximum bending moment there you can check as well another position for the same load group and check again the bending moments okay 82 something you can check uh, one of the very last positions right there you got uh, 153 but it doesn't make much sense to check the individual position if you want to check the crane you you might as well uh, check the envelopes load case like especially this one see this uh, envelope load case will return the maximum bending moment for the entire road the entire um, for the various positions of the crane so we are getting the 153 and uh, the 90 something at the beginning so the difference here between spans is because uh, the span length is actually it's not uh, uniform here I'm uh, I got six meters and on the first span it's uh, only for uh, 450 that's why we don't get the same bending moment uh, there is a there's a change uh, but you see, Advanced Design uh, stored the maximum bending moment for each position and it plays that information in the, the envelope load cases and then it will combine these envelope load cases with the other ones. So we can check uh, the bending moment. You can also check the shear force there with the other envelope. So here there will be a negative and uh, positive envelope load case right there you might also check the transverse force fy so same negative positive you can check uh, the torsion you can also check the forces on supports like if you're looking for the maximum uh, uh, compression on supports you will pick this um, like fz on supports but minimum sure you need to display the supports as well uh, see if we we can display the values i don't really need or well i can yeah, we can have the, the vectors but we might as well use uh, the values right there we can increase the font i think we've got a shortcut for increasing the font now yeah with page up page down yeah it's a uh, version 2022 if you use uh, the up and down arrows you can uh, easily change the font of any given text so you see with we've got an envelope case to get the maximum uh, actions on support So the benefits of having the envelope load cases is that we are uh, reducing the, the number of combinations and that way when we run the steel design uh, calculation time won't be impacted because we have so we only have a limited amount of combination you see now if i uh, run the steel design again on the columns see because uh, introducing the crane action 
I'm expecting a big change in the work ratio of the columns. So if I select them and I run the Eurocode 3 design again, so you see the progress bar will uh, speed up suddenly. It's quite fast. Um, and if I check the results, you see, so remember we had an 80% work ratio on the columns. But now, considering the crane actions, it's uh, now the columns are failed. And if I get a, more information from the shape sheet, uh, you see uh, the column is designed for uh, a combination of dead loads, snow, and crane action with uh, full effect. So 150 here because I'm with uh, the French national appendix, but for most countries, you will find uh, 135 there. And you see the envelopes that was uh, used here, it's the, the critical envelope is the one giving uh, the minimum actual force in the column because the compression is negative in advanced design like most uh, softwares. So it makes sense to have uh, this envelope uh, used in the combination. So from there, you know, we've got a failed, uh, we've got failed members, so we can either uh, Oh, let me check. There is a, there is a, yeah, we have a question or maybe a, an information from my colleague. Uh, like, yeah, yeah, you can, um, the envelopes on linear, linear elements will be used to design uh, the members, like the columns, the rafters, and the envelopes we had on supports will be used uh, when you're designing the footings or uh, the base plate. So make sure to have this, uh, uh, yeah, don't delete uh, some envelopes in order to speed up the calculation. Yeah, be advised not to do that. But here you see we've got uh, some failed members. So uh, it's classic Eurocode 3 design in advanced design. You can either uh, like increase the section and maybe use an IPE for 450, or uh, we can try something else and maybe try to reduce some uh, either some buckling effects or some uh, uh, but here you see we've got the contribution of uh, the in-plane buckling it's not that big it's like uh, only 10 percent uh, the most part of the work ratio is coming from uh, the in-plane bending so in this case we could try to act on the lateral torsional buckling effects because you see we've got the uh, ZLT, which accounts for uh, the reduction due to lateral torsional buckling effect. So it's almost 0 0.6, which means we've got a 40% reduction. We can try to mitigate that, and an easy way we can do that in advanced design is by placing some uh, lateral torsional buckling restraints. See, in advanced design, you can uh, select a member, like you can select all columns, and uh, you can place some restraints at, let me check. You can play them either at uh, mid height or we could place it uh, at 350 where the, the small cantilever is. One at 350, I will uh, copy onto the other flame so you can actually see the restraint there on the preview. Uh, I believe we can also see the restraints on the model. If I select the columns right there, you see you get the triangle. Uh, I've applied the restraint on both flanges, but actually you really need it on the compressed flange. So that would be the, the outer flange. Um, and we can update the Eurocode 3 results from there. So the calculation is uh, like maybe a few seconds. And in the optimization table this time, you see uh, I'm back to normal. Like uh, I've reduced that by uh, from 102% to 82%. The columns are no longer failed, and I didn't need to use a, a bigger section. But that's not new. It's a classic uh, Eurocode 3 design with uh, advanced design. So, um, yeah, this is uh, what I've just showed. We've got multiple crane position. You can analyze each position, but you're better off 
checking the envelopes in this case. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to show about Crane Action in advanced design. Uh, so as a reminder, we've got various input methods. We've got uh, the direct input that I only mentioned. We've got the crane loads, if you already know, like uh, the longitudinal force, the skewing force, and so on. Or you've got the crane parameter definition when you're given uh, the self-weight of the crane trolley and, uh, and the crane capacity. And from there, advanced design will um, combine, will use the dynamic factors to build the relevant load groups. Um, then you will generate the crane position. Then you will end up with multiple crane positions. Uh, you will get several positions for, uh, you will get one load case for each position and this will be repeated for each load group. But in the end, it doesn't matter how many positions you have because you will not combine these individual positions. You will combine the envelopes and that way we will reduce, we will keep the number of combinations to a minimum and that will also minimize the impact uh, on the calculation time, both for the finite element calculation and for the steel design calculation. All right, so this was the crane action part, uh, the implementation in uh, Advanced Design 2022. So, uh, Again, if you have any question about that, feel free to place it in the in the chat panel. I'm just checking something again. Yep. All right. And then we will move on to the other feature that I uh, wanted to show you, which was, um, yeah, design for cold formed members. You see, so cold formed design refers to a specific part of the Eurocode 3, which is part 1.3 but it will also reuse some uh, concepts that were introduced in uh, part 1.5. And part 1.5, we already know, it's, um, it's where we explain how to identify the ineffective parts of a compressed class 4 section. See, and all these formulas from part 1.5, they, they will still stand for cold form design. So here you can see uh, like the typical sections you might encounter for uh, uh, cold formed members. You see, we have uh, like uh, U like C shapes. We have angles. You can also have lipped channels. Um, you can have Z sections as well. Uh, you can even combine this section by having them like front to front or, or back to back. And what makes this section, this uh, cold form section, so special that they require a specific part of the Eurocode 3 is in fact their thickness. See, they, they, they are extremely thin. If we compare a usual channel with uh, like uh, an equivalent cold formed channel, the, even though they have the same height of 200 millimeters, the thickness is completely different. It's from uh, eight and a half millimeters to only two and sometimes one millimeter. But even though these sections are very thin, they are still quite strong. And in fact, they are strong enough to sustain the forces that are applied to them. And the reason why they are strong enough is in fact, uh, all the, the foldings, the multiple bends they have. See, because the more you bend the section, the stronger it, it gets. And that's why they have all these foldings. And actually the same with all materials. Um, if we compare that with a, a, a piece of paper, see, it's very thin and you cannot do much with it. But if you start folding it multiple times, you can make a, a paper plane out of it. 
So it's the same with the, the piece of metal. You you fold it, you bend it multiple times with a machine, and you end up with a profile that you can actually use for uh, uh, for construction. Um, but of course, to qualify as a cold form section, uh, the member must meet some geometrical proportions that are described there, and it's usually about uh, the length of the width of the of a segment divided by its uh, thickness and because these sections are so thin they will be affected by two effects uh, the first one we already know about it's called uh, uh, local plate buckling and uh, it's described in part 1.5 where we identify the ineffective parts of a compressed section uh, of a compressed section so for an internal compression element, so that would be the, the web or the flange, the ineffective part will be right in the middle of the compressed portion. And for the for an outstanding compression element, so that would be the leap, uh, the ineffective part will occur uh, at the very end of the compressed uh, portion. So nothing new there because this all this we already knew it was a uh, we already use that, these tables, for a class 4 design. Um, but then there is another effect, a second effect coming in, and it's called distortional buckling, and it's affecting the end stiffener of the section. And the end stiffener is the part that is made of uh, the lip and 50% of the compressed flange. See, this is called the end stiffener of the section. And because of distortional buckling, the end stiffener will get a reduced thickness. See, sometimes you you started with one millimeter, but you will end up with uh, only 0 0.6 or even 0 0.5 uh, thickness, uh, which is a significant reduction. So you need to take that into account in the design, but first you need to find out the proper thickness. And finding out this reduced thickness can be quite a chore because it's yeah it's very complex. You need to introduce a fictive spring. You need to find out the position of the neutral axis of the end stiffener. Then you can compute the effective section, the effective inertia, and then after uh, multiple iterations, you actually end up with the reduced thickness. But uh, don't worry, because you don't need to do that manually, because Advanced Design can, uh, can do that uh, quite accurately. So when you combine these two effects, like a local plate buckling with the ineffective parts and the distortional buckling on the end stiffener, uh, you end up with a section to use in the design that will be completely different from the section you started with. See there, we started with a Z section, but because of local plate buckling, uh, a huge portion of the web will become ineffective and uh, the middle of the flanges will also become ineffective. So obviously here we are in a pure compression situation because uh, it's affecting the middle of each portion of each uh, uh, element so this is local plate buckling but then you've got we also may be losing uh, the very end of the leap even if it doesn't show there uh, so this is the effect of local plate buckling but then you've got the other effect coming in which is a distortional buckling which is affecting the end stiffener the compressed end stiffener so uh, and it's giving that uh, reduced thickness there. So you see, you, this is a gross section, but this is a sec the effective cross section that you need to consider in the design. Uh, and you need to find out this effective cross section first in a pure compression situation and then in a pure bending situation to get proper uh, member design. So you really don't want to do that manually because uh, finding out this effective cross section is actually 50% uh, of the work and it's extremely complex and you can easily mess that up. So 
it's a good thing that advanced design can do that um, like in a second. So it's fast for uh, like the general idea of a call form design. Oh, we will see how it translates into advanced design, how it works, how you can actually introduce a call form member and perform the Euro code three design on that. And we will do that through uh, a few examples uh, covering the like the typical uses you might have for uh, for a call form member, beginning with uh, a simple case of a stud in like a, a stud in compression. So you see there we are told about uh, uh, pure compression element. So actual force, uh, it's doubly pinned. Uh, it's a leaped channel. We are given the dimension there. So like very very thin member. Uh, the yield strength is in the 350, which is uh, usual for uh, such members. It's usually in the 350, 355. So we will switch back to the advanced design model. I will uh, get back to the initial model without the crane actions. So that would be this one. And we will introduce uh, the stud, the, stud uh, the leaped channel stud somewhere in the model. I will just save it under a different name. So, yeah, I, I will define a stud somewhere in the platform. Like this member. So at this point, it's, it's definitely not uh, a call form member yet. It's just uh, like a classic IP 400. So I will turn that into a call form member, beginning with uh, uh, by changing its material. Yeah, picking it, picking a, a three fifty steel grade, and then I will change the section. So I will pick a user definition, uh, like a leaped channel. I will define thickness. Like a, so, we had one millimeter. I will define the radius. It's like the inner radius was three, so the outer one was plus one. Uh, the leap was 15 millimeters, the uh, width was 45, and the height was 150. And if you want this section to be treated as a call form member, you need to just change this parameter. So, from uh, need to pick uh, to define it as call formed rolled or call formed bent. It's a shame we, we cannot properly see the, the entire field, but it's it's will it will be fixed uh, so material cross section we can review the other parameters yeah yeah we should make sure that it's um, activated for design uh, the deflection we can actually disable them because we don't expect much of a deflection for a double pin member um, I can disable this section to speed up the calculation. And at this point, you see the, the call form, the channel is defined, and I can uh, run the finite element calculation to get uh, the internal forces on this stud, and i expecting uh, like a compression force, but nothing else, because this member is all it's properly hinged. You see, we got a hinge on top and it's um, connected to a pinned support. So the calculation is done. So only finite element calculation so far because I want to just review the internal forces. So as I told you, we are getting a an actual force, but there is no bending moment in there, either in the main plane or in the in the weak axis. So now we can uh, run the Eurocode 3 design on this uh, member. Uh, so this warning message, I'm just being told that some combinations were ignored in the calculation. Combination from 105 to 108 
and these are in fact the SLS combinations and indeed uh, I disable the deflection check on purpose so it makes sense that Advanced Design would warn me about something unusual but in this case uh, it's normal it was purely intended by the user uh, so if you want to check the results on this uh, member you can well you can display that graphically see we've got uh, all right or you can get them oh yeah, yeah it's not stability it's strength work maximum work ratio and i'm getting a 95 percent work ratio and if i want more information i can open up the the shape sheet and it's it's a shape it's the same shape sheet as you're probably already familiar with where we've got a cross section um, uh, cross section tab with the basic information uh, uh, about the section and then so the deflection tab is disabled so i cannot check anything there uh, but I, I can check the resistance tab and because the section was treated uh, as a cold form member it reads cfd for cold form design you can see there uh, in the compression check I'm getting the 30 kilonewton uh, axial force from the ULS combination and it's being compared to the compression resistance to the compressive uh, yeah, re resisting force of the column it's actually 40 uh, almost 40 kilonewtons and if we were to check that uh, you know we could uh, I consider the gross area which is a uh, 258 divided by 10 and multiply the steel grade which would be 350 so this is a compressive force uh, from the gross area 90 kilonewtons but in fact for the check I'm only getting 41 so you see the effective cross section is only getting a, a 40 kilonewton resisting force. That means a huge part of the section is in fact ineffective in this class 4 section. Uh, what we can see also from this shape sheet is that uh, it's not the member is not designed by, our, by pure compression. You see, we're getting a 76 percent, but what is driving the design is actually a mix of compression and bending and yet we didn't have any bending in the in the member we've made sure to to check that there's no in-plane bending there is no out of plane bending as well and yet we're getting some compression and bending and that is because what happens during the your code 3 design is uh, see this is a section you start with this is a gross uh, the gross section uh, with a one millimeter thickness so first of all advanced design will automatically ignore the metallic layer you see for a cold form section you've got a 0 0.04 millimeter uh, zinc layer so this one is already is not taken into account in the design so you got a 0 0.86 doesn't change much but it's it's taken into account by advanced design but then during the calculation you will get the effects of local plate buckling where you're losing a, a huge portion of the web there you're also losing some uh, equal parts on both flanges because we are in a pure compression situation we're also using uh, a small bit of the of the end of the leap and then you've got the effect of distortional buckling which is causing a reduced thickness uh, on the the end stiffness see from one millimeter to 0 0.6 and because of that we are getting um, a shift of the centroid of the section so the actual force you had in the first place is no longer centered it is now eccentric 
and this offset is producing a bending moment that we didn't have in the first place. And in fact, if we get if we check more detail for in the detailed shape sheet for this check, like compression and bending, you can see there is a delta mz bending moment, which is a uh, like increasing the work ratio of the section. And the bending moment itself is not big because the shift of the centroid is uh, very limited. But because it's occurring about the weak axis, the resisting force is also quite small. So this small bending moment by a small resistance will produce, uh, will increase the work ratio of by like plus 19 and this is why we go from a 76 percent in pure compression to a 95 percent work ratio for the actual uh, resistance of the member so you see even for a, a simplistic case of a member in pure compression the calculation behind is quite complex it involves like finding out the proper uh, effective cross section and also taking into account like a complex effect like the shift of the centroid and all the uh, the changes in the geometry that are that are introducing some additional uh, forces but as you can see our design is able to well, take all that into account in a matter of uh, seconds. Uh, this, uh, then we can check another uh, example, a typical one of a, uh, because it's common in building practice to have called for members for uh, uh, in platforms for a choice. See a double pin member in a, with a linear force uh, where you would use. A, Leaped channel again, so similar dimensions. So I've got one already in the model right there. So again, it's uh, like a very high steel grade. It's a leaped channel, it's a bit higher, it's a cold formed as well. Uh, it's activated for design. This time I will uh, yeah, activate the deflection because uh, I need to show you something about the deflection and I can uh, straight away run the Eurocode 3 design and check the shape sheet. So here again we've got the resistance which is not that big but uh, you see when, when it comes to deflection we are almost reaching the limit. We got 95% uh, ratio for deflection. That means We've got a, a six meter joist, and uh, we've got a three sixteen uh, ratio. That means we've got a one ninety centimeter deflection. But if we are to check, so this is the deflection we are getting from the Eurocode three design. But if we are to check the deflection that we got from the finite element calculation, you know, in advanced design you can uh, get the deflection for uh, at the end of the finite element calculation before you even run uh, the Yokot 3 design. See, you can access uh, deflection diagrams right there. So this is a finite element deflection. You can see it's a bit smaller. It's 170 instead of the 190 that I got at the end of the Eurocode 3 design. So we got two values. One is the shape sheet and another one from the finite element calculation. And the correct one is hopefully the one from uh, the shape sheet because that's something specific to cold form design. It is um, that when you're performing the SLS checks, such as the deflection check, you're supposed to do that with uh, not the gross cross-section, but the effective cross-section. 
even for, for deflection. It was not like that for the usual class 4 section, but you have it has to be done. It is that way for a call for members. So you see the, this channel, this choice that we have, uh, we will check its deflection with the effective cross section in pure bending. That means with losing some portion of the well of the flange of the compressed flange at the top is get is becoming ineffective so we are losing that and uh, we are also losing uh, some thickness on the compressed and stiffener so this is uh, the effective cross section that must be considered to find out the deflection so this finite element deflection is too optimistic the right one is the one from the shape sheet which is 190. So this shows you that we are properly using the effective cross section in uh, advanced design. So, and don't be surprised if you notice a difference between the finite element deflection and the uh, Eurocode 3 deflection. It's actually completely normal uh, when you have a, a class 4 section. And last, uh, I can show you uh, another common use you might have for a cold formed section, and that would be as a, a purling, because it's uh, common to have a Z purlings or sigma purlings or even a, a channel purlings. And actually, purling design when you're dealing with cold form members is actually quite complex. It's so complex that there is a dedicated chapter in the Eurocode 3 part uh, 1.3 uh, because when you're designing a purlin, you want to introduce to, to introduce all the help you can get from the roof. Like you will introduce the rotational restraint you can get from the roof as well as the shear stiffness you get from, uh, from the roof sheeting. Um, because the model that you use in the calculation is uh, you've got the member which is connected to a rotational spring and to a transverse spring as well, connected uh, on the top flange because, because this is where the roof actually connects to the purling. So to design a cold form purling, you can either use the analytical formulas from uh, chapter 10 of uh, Eurocode 3, part 1.3, or you can perform a numerical analysis um, with an initial bow imperfection, where the initial bow imperfection uh, has a the same uh, shape as the critical buckling mode based on uh, on a model analysis. And this is actually what we are doing in advanced design, like this numerical analysis with initial bow imperfection and so on. Because if you're familiar with advanced design, this is a feature we've, we've had for a, a few years now, uh, which is called the advanced stability. See? The advanced stability will perform a second order analysis, a numerical analy analysis on the isolated member, uh, taking into account an initial imperfection, uh, which is based on the, the critical Hagen mode, which is scaled to become a dis initial uh, uh, camber. And it takes into account also the torsion effects uh, and the warping that ensue. So I will uh, get back on the model and we will uh, like work on a, on a purlin. So it could be either a Z purlin or uh, a Sigma purlin. So at this point, it's, yeah, it's just a regular purlin in, uh, in I shape. So I will turn it into a, a call for member with a higher steel grade. Uh, I will this time go in the library uh, and pick a section from there because in advanced design you get access to uh, the library from advanced steel where you find like uh, yeah z sections uh, i guess i have yeah sigma section there um, 
and you can even add your own sigma section you see i will be working with this sigma section which is not from the manufacturer this is a sigma section that i created so i will use this one it's already displayed as a sigma section so it's a two span pearl in there and i will check the other parameters yes it's activated for design i will uh, yeah i'm interested in the deflections there and i will activate the advanced stability so for uh, this sigma perlin in the advanced stability dialog i will see um, in the nodal springs tab see i'm getting the three point supports that advanced design has detected because i've got uh, like the first support at zero i've got the middle one at 450 and the last one at nine so i can already help advanced design by setting them as hinged because uh, the purling is uh, simply supported the rafters uh, but you can also introduce some additional uh, supports that are not displayed on the 3d model like it's common to have anti sag bars in the middle of each span so if you ever need to introduce that you can simply add uh, a middle support like uh, 225 see in the middle of uh, each span uh, and you will define it as a ty restraint because ty i mean it's acting in the about the the weak axis it's a it's a support preventing the out of plane displacement so we've got one here in the middle of the first span i can uh, put an extra one in the middle of second span at 675 and same it will be a ty restraint yes and this is how you can define easily some anti-sac bars to help a member um, yeah because you see it's uh, common to have anti-sac bars in a uh, when you have a, a sigma section or uh, any call for members then you can move on to the bedding tab and the bedding tab is where you will define the contribution from the roof um, like the, con the linear restraint provided by the roof so first of all it will connect to the top flange layer and in this field you will define the um, rotational restraint See, so it in the Oracle three you are given a, a simple simple formula to to account for the rotational restraint. It's um, it depends on the number of uh, fasteners per meter of Berlin, and you multiply it by one thirty. So let's assume we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five fasteners per meter. See, you take five you multiply by 130 and that gives you the rotational restraint in newtons newtons per meter per radian and so on so you we'll just go in this tab so i'm in kilonewton so that would be 0 0.65 and there uh, you've got the rotational restraint then you can move on to the imperfection tab because uh, to introduce a local bow imperfection and from design will perform a model analysis on the isolated member uh, so that will give us the shape uh, of the critical eigen mode but to turn this eigen mode into a, a camber in millimeters we need to scale it that's why in advanced design you need to define here a scale factor for the eigen mode and the scale factor it depends on the buckling curve uh, and on the type of the section it can either be buckling curve b or buckling curve c but then in the chapter about Berlin, you are told that uh, you are advised to use buckling curve b then you refer to this other table from the record 3 where for buckling curve b you use a one over uh, you use a, a 250 scale factor 
but keep in mind that for a member in bending, uh, you are allowed to consider a 50% reduction on the camber for each span. So that would be, instead of a 250, it would be a, a 500 scale factor. And then, because we have a two-span member, uh, the reference length will not be nine meters, it will be shorter. So to account for that, I'm also like reducing again the scale factor, and uh, that's why I'm introducing a one over 1,000 scale factor. And eventually, you will define the load offset. So the load offset is, uh, again, it's defined 0, 3. Typically for gravity loading, uh, like snow and uh, uh, acting downwards, uh, the load is assumed uh, applied uh, very close to the web, which is actually good because uh, it's as close as possible to the shear center, so it will minimize the torsional effects. And it's only for the uplift loadings, like a wind, uh, like an uplift wind, that the load will be applied further away. So this is why in advanced design, <coughs> here you get to choose where the load applies. So it will be for sure on the on the top flange, but for a gravity load, I would apply it on point one, which is uh, on the web. But if you want uh, extra safety, you can apply it like in the middle of the web to account for gravity and uplift loading as well. So these are the parameters from the advanced stability. So I've made sure to describe them uh, well, so, but uh, it usually doesn't take that long. Uh, you can uh, just change the view that you actually need. And from there, we can, uh, well, run the finite element calculation to get the internal forces along the pearl in. And then we will perform the Euro code 3 design to get the work ratio of the of the member and, and see if it's uh, properly designed. So this is the section we are working in. I can run the Euro code 3 design on that and get the uh, zero cut three results either graphically or through the, the shape sheet and uh, actually here we can see that we've got uh, we got some uh, work ratio from the in-plane bending from the out of plane bending as well which was to be expected even for uh, from the bilateral bending but the section is not um, is actually designed by uh, some check that is uh, new and related to cold form design. You see, we've got uh, a total direct stress giving us an 86% work ratio. And uh, you see, this three entries total direct stress, total shear stress, and one with the stress. These three checks are already new and they are from. Uh, uh, the cold form design euro code, part of the euro code. See, these three checks, uh, the first one is usually driving the design, they refer to this section from the euro code 3, part 1, 3. So we've made sure to place uh, the re formula, the references of the formula. Uh, and the reason why we need those checks that are used for a member subjected to torsion is because uh, the section we are using, because they are asymmetric and because the shear center is not in line with the applied force. You see, for a sigma section, the shear center is outside of the section. So there is no way uh, the load can go through the shear center. There will always be an offset and this offset will create some torsion in the member and with torsion comes warping. That's why to properly assess the stress in the section, 
you need to account for the actual force component, the bending moment components, as well as the warping effect. And only the advanced stability feature that we have in Atlas Design can cover that. So this is why this is usually the uh, driving check for uh, for uh, such a complex member. And what you can see in this check is that it's compared to a stress limit of uh, 382 and you might be surprised by that given that the, the member was using a 355 steel grade you see so how come it's not 355 there well that is because for these checks these three checks you are allowed to consider uh, a higher uh, yield strength you see it's called a uh, it's called the average yield strength FYA as opposed to FYB and this limit is increased by the number of bands you have on the section you see the more bands you have the stronger the section will be so here we've got one two three and four 90 degrees bands and we've got one two three four 51 degrees bands and when you throw that in the formula you end up with the 383 stress limit and as on design is actually a bit more accurate and that's why it's probably counting the 382 uh, average yield strength for this member so you see here we've got uh, see the member is working at a with an 86 percent work ratio uh, we don't have uh, any issue with the deflection because we've got a, a two-span member so we didn't expect any any issue from deflection in the first place uh, but we could even reduce this work ratio if we ever needed to because we can act on the uh, on the member assumptions you see in the advanced stability in the first parameter I would uh, first of all if we had not done that already this is where we could introduce some anti sag bars see because the anti sag bars will limit the out of plane uh, displacement and the out of plane bending moment so this is one thing you can do when you need to reduce a rock ratio uh, on a member Another parameter you can uh, play with would be the rotational stiffness. You see, uh, so far we've used the simplified formula, uh, depending on the number of fasteners. But you can use an alternate formula, uh, which requires the detailed information about the fastening pattern. You need to know, like, um, uh, the rib widths you need to know like the thickness of the roof uh, itself uh, but it's totally worth it because when you use this alternate formula you can easily double the rotational stiffness you see and the higher the stiffness the better it is for the member because it will prevent the twist of the section see after uh, this new value if I run the calculation again See, I had like an 86% work ratio and now I'm only dealing with a 76% work ratio. So the rotational stiffness definitely helps. Now I can show you the impact of some other parameters like uh, while well, the imperfection, you cannot actually change anything like that. It's fixed, it's depending on the buckling curve, but you a lot of set can also have an impact on the work ratio because I told you that the closer you are from the shear center the better it is and in fact if I place the load as uh, really close to the web and I run the calculation again so so far we've got uh, 76 percent and now I've got uh, 67 because by getting closer to the shear center I'm minimizing the torsional effects and the warping reducing the work ratio and on the contrary if I play the load uh, all the way on to the leap side maybe you want to do that for extra safety but you will see the impact 
see it's increasing the torsion effects and that times it's even failing the member uh, but another way you can decrease the work ratio there is by introducing the shear stiffness you see the shear stiffness is uh, calculated by this formula from the Oracle 3 where you need to know the spacing between the purlins. you need to know the thickness of the roof you need to know the, uh, the dimension of the roof perpendicular to the purlin and when you actually compute that you get a value in the uh, in the 10,000 or uh, over 9,000 kilonewtons and when you, when you introduce that it will also help a member design in the, in the weak plane so now if I run the calculation uh, you see we had a failed member but now see we are we're down to 85 percent and uh, so this is the various parameters you have in the advanced stability and how they impact the work ratio sometimes some parameters will increase it will be uh, will increase the work ratio some other parameters will help and uh, this is uh, yeah, the impact they have so at this point yeah i think uh, that's what i wanted to show you anytime we're, we are running out of time so we will uh, we'll stop there for this presentation so we've seen uh, yeah, two major new features in uh, version 2022 that are grand actions and uh, design for call form members uh, so i hope i kept you interested uh, that uh, everything was clear if you have any question uh, you can definitely play them in the chat i will uh, get back to you with an answer by email else i will uh, thank you all for your attention um, and you can reach out to me by email at uh, thibaut.fret at uh, and uh, well i wish you all a, a nice evening and i hope to see you soon in the next uh, webinar so bye everyone